Today, we have for vaginal rejuvenation uh, an array of non-surgical options that include medications, exercises, and a variety of machines. Now, some of you in the audience have machines. Others are shopping around or deciding whether you want to buy a machine, and you're probably all confused. Okay, you see one, one person talking about incredible results with one machine, another one with a different machine getting incredible results. So the common theme should be machines seem to work pretty well. So that's, that's something that, uh, that we've noticed that uh, every, every speaker here has noticed. They've had positive experiences with machines. So we're going to go into a little bit of the, uh, the machines because this is the newest thing uh, on the block. All of the other uh, the medications and the exercises are pretty well known to the majority of, of people in the field. So we're going to take it not only in the aesthetic sense, but also in, in the clinical sense, because some of the procedures, as we've seen, they, they, they cover not only aesthetic concerns, but they also cover uh, some of the medical concerns uh, of women at various stages in their life. So let's look at a little history on uh, managing women's problems non-surgical. And we can go back 3,000 years. This is a stone pessary. Pessaries were made from animal feces, from stone, from ivory, from every material possible. This was the original non-surgical treatment for prolapse. You put an object in the vagina and the prolapse is no longer prolapse. Still used today, still an option for, for many women, but it goes back 3,000 years. 1,000 years ago, Trotula was a physician in Italy. And she, she was in the town which became the first medical school in Europe. And she wrote in a book on uh, vaginal constrictive substances, which were placed on, on tampons, to constrict the vagina to improve the quality of sex. This goes back a long time. Estrogen, which has been used for many years, uh, was isolated in the late 1930s and went into clinical use in the late 1940s. And it's still around and it still works very well. It's another non-surgical intervention for various treatments. Kegel in 1948. Now Everybody talks about the Kegel exercise, but how many of you have read Kegel's original paper? The guy was a genius. He not only had the exercises, he had the device, he had the exercise protocols. He was treating things that we're treating right now with incredible results. And I pulled this paper, and if you read it, you can't put it down. I mean, it's just as current right now as it was when he first wrote it, and you should read this paper. It's completely modern in every aspect of his approach to uh, the therapy. He used it in postpartum patients. He used it in menopausal patients. He used it in surgical patients. And he wondered why patients would have uh, posterior repairs and why these women would lose their tightness. And the Kegel exercise would improve the tightness even in surgical failures. Uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of it has to do with the lousy suture material they were using back then, but uh, some of this stuff is still very relevant. And this is what he used as his biofeedback. It's not digital. It doesn't pair up with a telephone. But it does everything a biofeedback unit needs to do. Give you feedback on the quality of your contractions. If you have that, it doesn't matter if you have a computer, a cell phone, an app. You can tell if you're doing a proper exercise properly. And his system, in his very, very simple but landmark paper, had all of the elements of rehab, of physical therapy. He talks about muscle education. He talks about the feedback. He talks about the resistance. He spent time and time and time with every patient teaching them which muscles to use and using programs of progressive intensity using his very simple feedback device. Now, people who say Kegels don't work, um, sure they don't work if you tell the woman just twitch your vagina uh, five times a minute if you don't have the, the biofeedback unit. So Kegel was never about just doing the exercises. He was always about the biofeedback. He was always about the regimens. It's just that 
nobody read his paper. They just take it as, oh, contracting the PC muscles, that's your Kegel. No, it's, that's like saying doing a curl is, is exercise. It is far from that. It was a whole program. And that's something you should keep in mind. Kaplan, Isaac Kaplan, gynecologist from Israel, in 1972, got the idea to use the laser in the field of gynecology for the very first time. He had a friend who was an ear, nose, and throat surgeon, and he showed him these new lasers they were using to burn off polyps in the throat. And Kaplan saw the immediate parallel in gynecology, so he was the first to take an ENT laser and use it in gynecology, and that's how the field of lasers in gynecology was born. About a year later, now meetings were taking place, meetings like these all over the world, and we had Dr. Bellina, Joseph Bellina, from New Orleans. Now, he took this laser and he started using it for diseases of the vagina, of the vulva, and he started using it as an instrument in open surgery for tubal reanastomosis. So it entered the mainstream of applications in gynecology. So the original CO2 was being used in the 1970s, very early on. And once Bellina brought it to the United States, all of the academics were using it. What they were doing at the time was burning down to the lamina, lamina propria. We're talking about now, people are asking, how deep does the Femi lift burn? 150 microns. These guys were going down two to three millimeters. Now, you can't do that under local. You can't do that in the office. That's certainly not painless. Uh, and that has a huge long and painful recovery. But it was treating disease. And it was treating it very effectively. Now, in the field of dermatology, lasers in cosmetics were being used for laser peels. If you ask some of the older uh, cosmetic surgeons, ask Joe Niamtu what kind of a laser peel he likes to do to get the best results, it's the full face peel with, with the CO2 full ablation. The problem is a recovery. It hurts like hell, and it takes months to heal, but it gets fantastic results. So Mansi and Anderson at Harvard in, in 2004 came up with the concept of fractional photothermolysis. Let's burn pixels and let's leave the skin in between untouched to accelerate the healing process. We'll go just as deep, and the skin that shrinks will cause tightening, the thermal effect and the trauma will cause a remodeling effect, so you get the best of both worlds. You get a laser effect, and the downtime is minimal, the pain is minimal, most of the complications are bypassed. So this was a breakthrough in, in technology, and, and this set off the whole field of the Fraxel and all of the other pixel technologies. So we have full ablative versus fractional laser. Now, I've modified this slide a little bit for CO2 to show you what they were doing in the early days because uh, the one that I took this from was for Urian, and it goes a little more superficial. But anyhow, you get the idea. Okay? If you leave healthy skin in between, you heal faster. Now we go to the gynecologist one more time. Stefano Salvatore and Adrian Gaspar. In 2009... They both started using a prototype laser, modified from the facial lasers, which had basically a right angle mirror so you could fire it 40, 90 degrees from your target, so you could fire it into the vaginal canal. And they used this prototype laser for the very first time to achieve fractional photothermolysis in the vagina. Here's what it looks like when you do a fraction. Well, that's a Femi lift, but it's the same technology, and what you see is a pixel pattern. And you're able to stimulate the vagina to produce collagen and to heal from a laser burn and produce whatever effects you're shooting to achieve. Now, go, going back to Salvatore and, and Gaspar, uh, they wanted to see if this would stimulate atrophic vaginal skin to thicken again. And what you see here is a premenopausal versus a postmenopausal vaginal wall biopsy. 
Yeah, what do you notice? Well, the layer of atrophy is a lot thinner than the layer without atrophy, and there's less blood vessels. Every gynecologist knows that. So they wanted to address vulvo and vaginal atrophy, which we just call VVA for short because it's a lot to write and a lot to say. Uh, but not any atrophy. We want to treat symptomatic atrophy. There's a lot of women with atrophy that have absolutely no issues with their atrophy. So we're going to focus on the ones who have specific symptoms. And it used to be called atrophic vaginitis. It was renamed it a few years ago to the genitourinary syndrome of menopause, or, or GSM, but basically it's atrophic vaginitis, and that also includes so, some of the urinary tract estrogen-sensitive areas, so they wanted to have a more inclusive and broader term. So you'll see this term all the time being used right now with uh, any kind of a laser study and any of the interventions for atrophic vaginitis. And the symptoms are severe itching, dryness, discharge, and painful sex, which is probably secondary to all of these other symptoms. And there are treatments out there that have worked well for many years. There, there are treatments that, uh, that are integrated with uh, some of the surgical treatments, uh, some of the non-surgical laser treatments, but basically we're addressing these issues. Now, the current options for non-surgical on the medication side are vaginal estrogen, uh, progesterone priming of the estrogen receptors, even in, in women with hysterectomy, to make the estrogen work better, and the, the CERMs, the selective estrogen receptor uh, medications. The only one with, with the vaginal effect right now on the market is aspemaphine or, or asphena. Now, they all work well, but they all carry these warning labels that scare the hell out of the patients. Now, you might say a micro dose of estrogen is never going to give anybody breast cancer, but try to convince the patient to take the medication. They won't do it. They'll go on the internet, they'll read a little something, they'll read the package insert, and they'll be terrified. So they will walk around with itching, a dry vagina, and painful sex. What have you achieved? Nothing. All right, so we have a study, a successful treatment of postoperative and traumatic scarring. This is for face with carbon dioxide ablative fractional resurfacing. And this is the article that gave Salvatore and Gaspar the idea to try the CO2 laser in the vagina. Worked on the face for similar skin. So th this is from, from that paper, from, from, the, from the facial application. And uh, the slide cut off a little bit. But they showed a, a, a very, very significant increase in the volume of tissue uh, just from a reversal of the atrophy. So they said, let's try this in the vagina. And this was the original prototype unit. The original company's uh, device was from Deca, an Italian company. And they made this cage with, with a mirror in it. So when you fire the laser, it shoots out at 90 degrees and you can get the canal. And this was the original paper. I was actually the reviewer uh, of this paper for the American Journal of Cosmetic Surgery. And I knew Adrian very well. Uh, he had trained it, uh, in liposuction with me years ago. Um, and I knew he wasn't crazy. But when I first heard about this, I, I thought he was nuts. I said, what are you doing? You know, firing a laser into a vagina. And he's like, no, just read the paper. So I read it. He had biopsied. He had done, you know, very scientific analysis of... Uh, of his before and after work to, to see what was, what was going on with the laser effects. So this is what he found. You know, the, the atrophy was reversed by the laser. Now, his, his study was not pure. It was not clean. What, what he did in addition to firing the laser is two weeks before and two weeks after the laser treatments, he injected PRP. Okay. He was approaching a cosmetic patient, and he wanted to fix the patient with everything he had. And he wanted to do a study at the same time. He didn't want to deny them the PRP. So what he did, he did the second best thing. He did a control group without a laser, and a con control group with a laser. But both groups got PRP, they both did Kegels, and, and the laser was the variable. Well, to me, that's just common sense. You know, you throw everything you have 
at the patient, and you know some of it will stick and some of it won't. But from a pure scientific basis, uh, you know it's a little bit cloudy because there's multiple things going on. Anyhow, atrophy was reversed. And this is what he measured. He measured vaginal dryness, dyspareunia, and burning sensation. And so 40 cases got lasered, and 52 did not. And you have 67, 62, 50% versus 23, 15, and 19% improvement. And this was the first time anybody had done a study with a CO2 laser, but the results were promising, preliminary as they were. And he's showing here revascularization occurring. Blood vessels are, are increasing in density. Then we had, in 2014, a Salvatore study. Now, this one's the one that, that got the most publicity because the American Journal of Cosmetic Surgery is not in the PubMed. So this one, in Climacteric, this one was picked up by all of the, uh, all of the PubMed uh, databases. Um, and it was a 12-week study of 50 patients with fractional CO2 uh, in, in treatment of vaginal atrophy, vulvovaginal atrophy with biopsies. And uh, you can see what the, the pixel effect looks like in the, in the vagina. These were actually taken by Alex Bader, who's, who's right here. And I've been trying to get good shots in there. I don't know what kind of camera he used, but I'm going to find out. Uh, they also measured what's called the vaginal health index. It's uh, five parameters, uh, some are subjective and, and some are not. You, you measure pH, uh, you have an assessment of moisture, which is kind of a hazy endpoint, epithelial integrity, fluid volume, and elasticity. Anyhow, it's a commonly used uh, index, and they wanted to see if, if, if using the, the laser would improve this. So this is Salvatore's uh, study on the uh, VHR. And he found a significant increase in the VHR scores. And just in questionnaires, 84% the satisfaction rate and no complications. And this is uh, before the treatment. This is four weeks after the first treatment. And the bottom one is four weeks after the second treatment. And you can see a significant improvement in the, the effects of reversal of the vaginal atrophy. You can see it again on another one. And you can see it again on another one. It's a consistent reaction to being lasered. Now, the dermatologists have known this for years. People get laser peels. There's no such thing as a laser peel that didn't work. They all work to a degree. They may work better in some patients than others, but the skin will respond to being lasered. It, it has to. It doesn't have a choice. Another study, this is from 2015, from another group from, from Italy, another one with fractional CO2, studying basically the same thing. Three sessions of CO2 laser of the vagina, four weeks apart with each. All right, 48 postmenopausal patients with significant increase in the VHI scores and 91% satisfaction with the procedure. The breast cancer survivors. This is a group where, you know, they, they're totally afraid to take estrogen. And you might find, you know, some oncologists say it's okay, but, uh, you know, patients are terrified and they don't want the estrogen. So they're a good candidate uh, group for, for this type of, of procedure. In November, the North American Menopause Society came out with, uh, with an article. It was... Uh, a question and answer, but it, it was really a position statement cloaked in a little uh, answer to a question online. A laser treatment safe for vulval vaginal atrophy. And, you know, the question, well, my patients are requesting these new treatments, what should I tell them? Well, basically they, they, it boiled down to looking at the Salvatore study and saying there's preliminary results that look pretty good, but they're very preliminary, there's no long-term data, and Vaginal estrogen use is very inexpensive compared to these lasers. And they quoted a number. They said it costs $300 a year to treat a woman with vaginal estrogen. So I don't believe anything I hear. So I went online and I checked the numbers, and I'll show you what I found. 
And it's very interesting what I found. What I found is this. This is from Costco, which is the cheapest place to buy medications. And this was uh, last week. If you take Vagifem for a year, and you pay out of pocket for the whole thing, you're paying about $2,500, which is more than I charge for three sessions of Femilip, which give you at least a year of effect. Premarin cream, if you want to use the most aggressive protocol, which is 21 days on and seven days off for a full year, you're paying $2,000. If you want to use the bulky and uncomfortable S-string, you pay $1,550. And if you want to use Osfina, you're paying $2,500 again. So I don't know where they pulled the numbers out of, but they're completely bogus, and they have nothing to do with reality. You go on the web, you call your pharmacist. What does it cost for a year's worth of estrogen? And, and you come up with these numbers. For a year. And, you know, some people are saying, you know, my, my, my family patients are happy for more than a year. The longer it stays, the cheaper it is. So I think, you know, if you, if you measure the one-year cost of, uh, of medications that are already out there, it, it's, it's on par. It's basically the same cost. The consensus uh, atrophy is it works well on biopsies. It works well on patient satisfaction scores. It's been shown in multiple groups, multiple centers, different doctors. So it works. We don't have long-term data, but the best data that we have show that it works. And uh, so that, that's where it stands. You shouldn't feel bad about offering it to the patient. You shouldn't feel uncertain about what it's going to do. It's going to improve vaginal atrophy. Now, if we take it one step further, women who breastfeed, okay, they get vaginal atrophy too. And if they're breastfeeding, sometimes they don't want to take estrogen. It may affect the milk. It may get through the milk to the baby, whatever. Even if it's completely harmless, they're afraid to use it. And if they're going to breastfeed 8, 9, 10 months, why should they have to suffer with a dry vagina? No reason. So that's another uh, use, a potential use, of, of these technologies to help the patient have a better sex life without affecting the quality of the breast milk. Now, if you ask anybody who does pelvic surgery, when they operate on a menopausal patient, almost all of them will throw in some estrogen cream at the end of the case. What for? Well, estrogen stimulates the skin to thicken. Would you rather have your, sur your, your surgery healing with thicker skin or thinner skin? Obviously, thicker skin. So why not use lasers to do the same thing? You can use them before the surgery. You can use them after the surgery. There's really no reason not to. So this is another situation where you could just integrate things you already do to achieve better effects than what you could normally achieve with just doing straight surgery. So there's no downside to this. Now, I went to the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists annual meeting in May. And in the exhibit hall, there were seven laser companies. Okay, They probably paid ACOG, I don't know, north of $50,000. So ACOG had nothing to say about vaginal rejuvenation, but it was being advertised all over the place in the meeting hall. I don't have a problem with that. But then they come out with this statement. Three days after the meeting, now, I was on the ACOG Cosmetic Surgery Task Force in 2007 and 2008. And these statements don't come out overnight. It takes a year. They have at least two or three meetings, and they put out a statement. So I know that this wasn't a response to the exhibit hall. But they had to know that the money that was going to come to the exhibit hall would come in better if they kept their mouth shut for three more days. But what did they actually say? Well, let's take a look at it. The lasers that are on the market right now, whether they're used for a CO2 facial peel, whether they're used for endometriosis, whether they're used for genital warts, for incisions, for whatever use they're used in every single field of surgery, this is all the FDA approvals mean. Not one single laser is approved for a specific condition. So if you're using your laser to treat endometriosis, guess what? It wasn't FDA approved for endometriosis. 
If you're using a laser to do a facial peel, it wasn't approved for a facial peel. The language is just not in the FDA approval. And no company in their right mind would put it in that way because it restricts their ability to sell their laser. It's like applying for a patent. You shoot broad. You use broad language. So you can't say it's FDA approved for incontinence because that's not the language of the FDA approval. You can use it to ablate. And the ablation might have effects that were the intended result of ablating. You can incise. You can excise. But you can't say that it's FDA cleared for removing warts. Problem is, when you go online, people are advertising it like that. And the problem that ACOG had is that patients were being fooled into thinking that these procedures have long-term data, which they don't. So whether they work or not, whether we're all pro about them is irrelevant. The patients were being fed a misleading statement, and that ACOG didn't like that. That's all. They didn't say anything more. They didn't say anything less. So vaginal fractional CO2 is ablation and vaporization. Erbium, same thing. You can say different things about radio frequency. They're all approved for use in the vagina. And you as the clinician decide what the intent of that treatment is going to be. But that's not what the FDA approval says. It never was and it never will be. So going to the next step, it's not an off-label use to ablate the vagina. So don't be afraid of getting a CO2 laser or an erbium or a radio frequency and using it. You're not using it off-label. The intent was to ablate, the intent was to heat up. Well, you're doing that. So have no fear. And guess what? Ablation fixes atrophy. The, the Italians have been working on, uh, on vaginal work. Everybody's working on different lasers, and we all want to see results of these things working because the more results that we see, the more, the more confidence we have when we sit across from the patient and tell them, I want you to spend cash for this procedure, and I think it's going to have good results for you because it's had great results for other people. All right, now here's one that's a brand new indication. Now, it's not a brand new indication in the sense that lasers haven't been used, but fractional lasers haven't been used for lichen. It's, it's a brand new indication. And this is something, I get emails from patients, I get emails from doctors, you know, that I've consulted on for, for CO2. Um, they're always asking me, what about lichen? What about lichen? You know, what does it do? What do you do? How do you use it? I say, well, let me tell you what, uh, what I know. So, if you've never seen lichen sclerosis, this is lichen. And I put up a ton of lichen slides, so by the end of these slides, you'll have a pretty good idea of what it looks like. White patchy skin, and if it's been around for a while, you get what's called agglutination. Things stick together. It's very, very uh, fragile. And it itches like crazy. And patients come in with the itching. That's the number one concern. It's probably the only concern. It's incredible itching they can't get rid of. Here's a glutination. Now, it affects men and women. In, in men, it affects the, uh, the head of the penis or the foreskin if they're not circumcised. It's also found in non-genital areas, and you can have it and not have any itching. So you can walk around and like it all day long. If it doesn't itch, you really don't need to do anything about it. So here, here's, the, uh, here's the foreskin. And uh, this is something you'll find. It's all over the gynae literature. It's all over the urology literature. It's the two most common uh, manifestations of lichen. Now, you have to biopsy. You can't just say, oh, it looks like lichen. Let me go treat it. Because 5% have cancer. It's going to sell. And you have to keep watching them because uh, an increased risk of cancer accompanies this disease. So if, if you're going to treat them, Either work conjunction, in, in conjunction with somebody who's going to do the surveillance. If you don't do surveillance, uh, send them to a dermatologist if, if you want to do, uh, you know, full body uh, assessments. But uh, remember, okay, treating them is not the end of the treatment. That is a management type of a condition. You have to just keep watching them and, and assess them from, si from time to time because they carry that increased risk of squamous cell cancer. And this is what you see. The epidermis is very thin, and then you have this very sclerotic stroma. It's like a desert in there. And then deep down, you have dermal inflammation. 
Now, the treatment of choice, basically the, the only treatment that has worked very well is steroids. Here's some more lighting. Corticosteroids. Clobetasol is the go-to for, for most gynecologists. And then uh, you have some of these newer uh, drugs, the calcineurin inhibitors. Uh, Protopic is one. Uh, another one is uh, Elidel. Uh, Tacrolimus, I forget what the Elidel is, the technical name. Uh, and then some people use retinoids, but they don't tolerate retinoids very well in the vulva. It burns like hell. So retinoids, really, if you tried them once on a, on a vulva, you'll never try it again. The patient will jump. She, she won't like it. So for, for, for the vagina area, it's either steroids or, uh, or protopic or laser. Let's, let's start with the, with the reports. You know, let's, let's see what we have. And what I found was a lot of literature, older literature, on ablative CO2 laser with pretty good results. So ablative, so just full field blasting under general anesthesia of the entire area. And let's go back, 1984. Okay, we have Labreco from Chicago, gynecologist. He was doing full ablations to three millimeters. That's deep. That's like cutting the skin off. Uh, at the time, they were doing vulvectomies for this. So this was something less invasive than a vulvectomy, but it's just a deep laser. And what he found with the full ablation is 19 of 28 women improved, slightly under 70%. But what he also found, he followed the patients, he said, after these treatments, steroids work better. Well, no kidding, you burned off all the skin, there's nothing left. But, but still, you know, there's a recurrence to this, to this problem, and just to be able to get a response, a positive response, in a woman who's itching like crazy, well, that's a good thing. Now, Stewart, an oncologist, he went an oncologist from Calgary in 1991. He was a little more conservative. He went one to two millimeters, that's still huge. That's 20 times as deep as a Femi lift under general anesthesia. 86% improved at 12 to 37 months. That's only six patients. Uh, however, improvement in 86% for, for lichen is pretty good. Vindal from Sweden, full ablation, this is in men now, the glands. Now this is a 14 year follow up. 15 to 20 watts defocused, you're using a two millimeter spot. So what he found at 14 years, some of these people had died. So he identified 50 of the living, and 40 of the 50 were improved at 14 years. And the remaining 10 had minor symptoms. None of them wanted to be relasered, which is no surprise. But they, you know, they said minor symptoms. Uh, also, good data, very long term. And then, you know, I'm always searching the literature, and this popped up, this just came out, fractional CO2 from Australia from, from June. Andrew Lee, uh, dermatologist, and what, what they did is they, they had one patient who had lichen, and they sent that patient to the GYN oncologist. And he did a full ablative CO2, and the patient improved. So the next four patients that came in, they said, oh, let's not send them to the oncologist. Let's just do our biopsies, and let's treat them with fractional CO2 and see if they improve. If they don't improve, we'll send them to the oncologist. And that's exactly what they did. And they used a topical anesthetic, a cream, and they went to 150 microns. I don't know what company they used. It was, it was, uh, it was a CO2 laser fractional, and they used energy settings of 140 to 170 millijoules, now, from, from company to company, the settings will vary. So you can't say that it's the same as a Femi lift or the same as uh, uh, a Juliet, which is a completely different technology. So you really have to do a little math to figure out what dose they're getting and compare it from one company to another. Anyhow, they used a matrix, which is about 10 millimeters, shaped like a stop sign, an hexagonal matrix, and two passes at 60% density. And what they found, they kept everybody on steroids. They never stopped the steroid therapy. And two of the patients were asymptomatic at six months, and two were retreated at six months. So it doesn't say much, but hey, it's the only study in the literature. So it's not a common disease that you find in a practice, but uh, when, when you see it, and if you want to treat it, let me tell you how I've treated it. I've treated three patients, and uh, the first patient I treated was about a year and a half ago, and the most recent was 
um, say about five months ago, they all improved. This is from Lee's uh, paper, before and after, which is pretty good. I mean, there's no photography trick. The, the light seems to be the same. Um, the patient looks like it's the same, a little less hair, but uh, it all looks the same to me. So uh, I would believe that these are the same people. All right, so my protocol, again, based off of just, you know, intuition and my experience with lasers in general, because I use them all the time for, uh, for condyloma and everything else, um, I'm a little bit lazy. I just use, instead of taking off the, uh, the Femi lift head and putting the stamping head on the unit, I don't want to have to clean it. So I use a Femi lift probe. Okay, it's a self-contained piece of uh, plastic. I don't have to clean my probe after I use this. So I just take the Femilift probe and I just press it down against the skin and just blast, blast the area of lichen sclerosis. So if you want to use a hexagonal head, it'll work just as well. It's just one more piece of equipment you have to clean. All right, I use tumescent local anesthesia, which is the same as I use for liposuction. I put it in a 5cc syringe and I attach it to a 32 gauge Botox needle. And if you think a needle stick hurts because it's lichen sclerosis in the perineum, they don't feel it with a 32 gauge needle. Okay? If you don't believe me, just try it. They don't feel it. And I'll inject maybe one or two cc's, one or two cc's, one or two cc's. Go as far as you need to around the entire area. It takes two seconds. The needle stick doesn't bleed because it's so little. Um, and I do two passes. So I'll use the Femi lift, set at the medium power setting, which is 30 watts. Low is 20, 30 is, is the medium, and 70 is high. So I'll use it at 30 watts, and I'll use it at the uh, 50 millijoule setting, which is the test spot setting when you're doing a vaginal ablation. And I'll do a step. So I'll, I'll hit the area twice. Boom, boom. I'll go to the next spot until I've done the entire area of lichen sclerosis. It takes less than two minutes from injection of tumescent to being done with the procedure. And when I'm done, they get Vaseline. Vaseline and Aquaphor, or, or Aquaphor, and very little discomfort. Okay? So... That's my experience with it. It seems to work with a very low dose, very simple protocol. Let's take a look at urinary incontinence. I know everybody has talked about it before. Um, so these are erbium studies. These are the earliest studies on incontinence that were published. There are a lot that are presented. There are a lot coming soon. But if you open up the literature right now, this is what you get. You have Ivan Fistanek in Croatia. He did a single session on 39 women with mild to moderate stress incontinence. He analyzed them with questionnaires and Q-tip tests. Okay. Now, basically, a Q-tip test means that when you cough and sneeze and leak, all right, the bladder neck is dropping down. If you stuck a Q-tip in the urethra, it's going to point up to the sky. So if you're fixing it, that degree of Q-tip movement is getting less. So the angle is getting smaller. So a lower Q-tip angle is improving. So his questionnaire was the ICIQ UI. And a high score is bad and a low score is good. So he improved the ICIQ UI scores and the Q-tip angles. But statistically, his study is a piece of junk. Okay, he's got three months follow-up on half of the patients. And at the six months, only six patients. Now, you know, you can't blame the guy. That this is his patient, this is the only follow-up, but if these are numbers, from a purely number standpoint, it's a very weak study to be able to prove anything. But it was an attempt. Senkar, Sabina Senkar in Slovenia, which is right next to Croatia, it's wedged in between Croatia and Italy, did the same study, basically. And she took 107 women with stress incontinence and mixed incontinence. They so had a mishmash of, of indications. And she found improved ICIQ UI scores of 92.5% at six months. But let's see, 92.5% of what? How many patients came back? All right, I don't have those numbers. Uh, Fistanek did a repeat study of his original study. Basically, it's the same study, just new patients. 
And uh, he sets the result of the questionnaire. And again, there's a follow-up issue. But the ICIQ UI scores are improving. All right, so, so what do you make out of this? Well, you're making a trade, okay? The trade is this. I can give you a procedure that might improve your incontinence, that doesn't require surgery, doesn't require drugs, and that has zero side effects, okay? If, if you want to try it, we'll try it. But since the numbers aren't that good, okay, look, this is what I have with the numbers. The only studies I have. The stratification of patients by type. All right, you try to present this at all, because they would throw you right out of the building. It would never fly. There's no long-term data. There's no set protocols. One guy's doing one thing, another researcher is doing another. So as far as what do I have in paper, there's nothing. Zero. And there's a million different types of incontinence. Uh, if you go online, when you talk to people in the general, uh, I have a laser or I have a, a radio frequency device market, they're just doing these techniques blindly. They're, you know, some of them have no training in gynecology. This is a firing machine and making promises. So this is what I see happening. Let's just shoot and see, and we'll, we'll load this up with a bunch of prom promises. Okay? Is there anything wrong with that? You might say, well, no. If she wants to pay, that's fine. We'll just see if it works. If she's happy, we're happy. Well, what could go wrong with this? Well, this is what could go wrong with this. It's a waste of money for the patient. Okay? You just talked her into something that wasn't covered by insurance and it didn't work. What happens to you? You lose credibility. You know, if, if you tell me that something is going to work and I buy it and it doesn't work, what do I think of you? You know, what are you going to do for me now? You promised me something and I didn't get anything out of it. If a lot of people do this, then the, the technology loses credibility. Then no matter what else comes out, you have this huge burden. You're dragging this, this laundry all over the place. Well, you know, it just didn't work for me. So what's, what's a better approach? This is what we do in cosmetics. The first thing we train people to do in cosmetics is set a low expectation that you can always meet. Okay? It might improve your incontinence. But I'm not going to hype it up to the crazy level that, you know, the proponents do because you're setting yourself up to fail. Okay. Second, I'm not going to ask you to invest the full amount up front because for incontinence, I don't have the numbers to prove it. So I'm going to set a low bar and say, do a test drive. Okay. I'll give you one treatment for 200 bucks. That's what it's going to cost you to satisfy your curiosity. That's going to be your test to see if it works for you. Because if it works for you, then I'm going to charge you later because now we know it works. Now we know this investment is worthwhile for you. That way, you don't lose the credibility. You don't make the patient lose a ton of money. And she will see you as a very honest guy or girl and come back for surgery or procedures forever. Even better approach? Do what Gaspar did in, in 2009. Mix it with 10 different things. All right, when you have a stock portfolio, do you put all your money into one stock? No. Why? Because if it doesn't move, you're screwed. Same with this, okay? Make it a package. You know, use bioidenticals, use kegels, use the biofeedback, throw it all together. And then we have energy tuning. This has been talked about before. This is just finding the right doses of energy for the patients. So, you know, you start out with the protocols the companies have because you don't have anything else to go with. But after a while, you want to get better results. So, I don't care if a procedure is uncomfortable because I tell the patient, the more energy I can, I can deliver in there, the more collagen I can stimulate. Do you want me to back off and make it comfortable, or do you want a result? Yeah, you know, it's the same thing. You go, to, you go to the health club right here in the hotel. Okay, do you want to get in shape, or do you want to sit on the machine and drink your latte and, and pretend? I can make you comfortable, or I can make you better. You choose. So, what are the takeaways from this lecture? Well, re rejuvenation is not a machine, it's more than machines. You have to know the indications, you have to understand the anatomy, the conditions, and you have to know the alternatives. And you can blend them all together to create something that's truly going to provide a benefit to the patient, a benefit to your practice, 
And it's going to just garner a great reputation for, for all of this stuff. Thank you.